Hey everybody, Christian McBride here. Welcome to the Jazz House Kids Friday Night Listening Hang. You know, we've been doing the show for a while now, and we'd like to take you back in time to our second Friday Night Listening Hang, which we did on March 27th, 2020. We were just getting our feet wet with the Friday Night Hang, and uh, it was it's always been so much fun. But it was really fun because we didn't quite have our footing yet. You know, but we had a show that night that featured four of the greatest trumpet players that we know, friends of ours personally and friends of Jazz House Kids. They've been part of the Jazz House Kids family for many, many years, and they have deeply inspired and influenced so many of our students at Jazz House Kids. And in fact, we want you to see Jazz House Kids' mission in action. We want to show you a fantastic young pianist, Mr. Jasper Zimmerman. Check this out. Hello, my name is Jasper Zimmerman. I'm 13 years old. I play piano and I'm in Mike Lee's improvisation class, Andy McKee's ambassadors, and the Jazz House Big Band led by Abraham Burden. I'm going to play for you a piece that I wrote called Swing State. Jazz House Stay at Home School program because um, it offers a great education experience from the comfort of our own home. Also, we can get one-to-one -one private instruction, which we wouldn't normally get otherwise. How about that? Now that's what Jazz House Kids does. All your support makes things like that happen. Now we're going to get to the show. Let's talk some trumpet. Good evening, world. Welcome to the Friday Night Jazz House Kids listening party from a few different places. I'm your host, Christian McBride, here at home in Montclair, New Jersey. And uh, tonight we are going to do some trumpet talk. I'm not going to speak much tonight because we got four of the baddest trumpet players in the whole world. They're not only friends of mine personally, but they're also Jazz House Kids family. And uh, so many of our students have been uh, directly influenced and inspired by them. Introducing Mr. Freddie Hendricks, who also plays in my big band. Freddie Hendricks in the house. The great right. Marcus Printup, also known as Jackie right. Robinson in the house tonight. <laughs> Mr. Ted <laughs> Chubb, my main man. Yeah. Ashton Bueller in the house. <laughs> and Mr. Nathan Eklund. Give it up for the quartet. Yay. There you go. So before we get into our trumpet talk, I'm going to invite the boss, the big cheese, the head of Jazz House Kids and the household. Please say hello to my wife, the queen, Melissa Walker, ladies and gentlemen. Yay! She got some things she needs to lay down for y'all. Hey there, babe. <laughs> By the way, this is my 14th day, so I'm officially out of self-quarantine. Yay! Woo! All right. Good, good, good. Move now I can kiss my wife. <laughs> How you doing, everyone? Uh, hello. Good to see you. Good to be back. Um, certainly been another interesting week in the world. Mm. And, um, you know, 10,000 people tuned in, 7, 000, over 7,000 live. We had friends from Taiwan and Australia and Slovenia and Slovakia and Yay. Japan and Texas and, you know, just everywhere. Um, thank you for all of the many, many uh, kind uh, comments that you wrote and, you know, just seemed to mean a lot to you. And it certainly meant a lot to us. You know, as the founder and president of Jazz House Kids, I just want to say we want to thank those of you who were able to tip in the tip jar. Uh, it helps us present jazz each and every day. And you know, even in these really, really tough times, I gotta tell you, we have been running 21 ensembles online for kids wow. eight wow. and up. Dig it. Uh, you know, it has really been, if it wasn't transformational before, it certainly has been in these really tough times. 
And one of the things I want to let you know is a number of people have been writing in to say, well, how do we join? So if you'd like to take an ensemble session, chat, uh, improv, jazz vocabulary, you know, please write us at info at Jazz House Kids because we will be opening up some uh, sessions, you know, just for you guys. And it would be it would be really awesome if we could come together in another way around this world. That's right. Pay attention. So, mm -hmm. you know, each and every day, just what Jazz House Kids does, it brings this music, keeps it alive, and really makes sure it's there for the next generation. And these cats right here on the line are a lot of the backbone of this organization. So I know we got a really special session for you. I just got to tell you, you know, okay, we have piano, of course, the great McCoy Tyner trumpet. But next week, we're going to talk about the singing. Come on now. And the great Dee Dee Bridgewater is going to be Ooh. in the house. Oh, uh, Dee Dee. <laughs> Dee Dee. So we're going to have some singer talk. Myself, we'll get some friends to join us. Same time, same place. We call it Jazz House Kids. It is the uh, hang at home, and we take that seriously, right. our listening session. So just a couple things I want to tell you. We had a lot of fun last week hearing from everybody. So if you want to chat with us, and you're on Facebook Live or you're on Zoom, go ahead, write in and chat with each other. But we'll try to get to as many of those questions and comments as we can. And a couple of times, we're gonna open up the phone lines to our friends on Zoom. And they just take the conversation up a notch. We had a, a, a number of musicians join in and uh, others mm -hmm. last week. So get ready for that. We'll kind of do that midway through and near uh, the end. And just, uh, let's see what else do I have for housekeeping. Again, if you're interested in ensemble, write info at jazzhousekids.org. Same time, same place next week. And also, yeah, think about joining that tip jar. Just imagine if 10,000 people all donated a dollar, what that would mean. That's all, all you need, a buck. That's all we need, and that's a lot of lessons and a lot of hands of the young people and for this music. That's so right. everybody online, we really invite you to make a difference because you can. And babe, thank you so much. And to all of you, mwah, here's to you. One of my favorite lines from a movie says, tighten up and dig deeper. I know it is right. rough, but it is now or never. All right, <laughs> now or never. <laughs> I know it's rough. Nobody's making any bread. We're trying to make do, do the best we can. But uh, as you can see, we got these wonderful master musicians here, and they are uh, really inspiring our, our children. Uh, one more person I would like to introduce to you, our technical director, Brother yeah. Gallo Inger. Give it up for Gallo. <laughs> so if stuff starts going wrong, <laughs> it's his fault. <laughs> oh, Gal, you know you, my man. Uh, let's see. Let's get this show on the road and talk about All some right. trumpet. Um, yeah. We have a, a really wonderful program scheduled for you tonight. We're gonna we, we're gonna keep this uh, nice and loose and familial. Uh, you will you will be uh, witness to what we discuss backstage in the club or at the bar when we start getting into our music talk. Um, now I'm going to get out of the way since I, I don't play the trumpet. Well, I, I play the trumpet <laughs> extremely poorly. Excuse me? Uh, so <laughs> that doesn't really count, but, uh, I'm going to jump in and play my <clears throat> first selection so I can get out of the way. And then I'm going to let the masters have it. Uh, many of you know that, um, I had a very close relationship on and off stage with the late, great Roy Hargrove. Uh, I met Roy Hargrove. Uh, we were both in high school. I was a sophomore. He was a junior. We met at a uh, at a at a uh, competition called Music Fest USA. It was in Chicago, mm -hmm. and uh, word had gotten up to Philly about this cat in Dallas, Texas, who was about to be the next cat, and mm -hmm. uh, that was the understatement of the century. We went down. Mm -hmm. We went out to Chicago for this competition, and we heard him play, and uh, our, our mouths were on the floor, and. Uh, Roy and I moved to New York roughly around the same time. He moved to New York about six months, six to eight months after I did. And I went on the road with his first band. And uh, I played on his album, Public Eye. He played on my first album, Getting To It. 
And uh, we shared a lot of fun, fun moments on and off the stage. So I want to get this trumpet party started by sharing with you um, um, a pretty fun, casual moment. This happened in 2010. Uh, I was touring with Chick Corea and a trio called the Freedom Band with Kenny Garrett uh, and Roy Haynes on drums. And we played in Marciac in the summer of 2010. And Roy played the night after us. Um, and he, he was there just hanging out and Chick invited him to come sit in. So what I'm going to play for you is the Chick Corea Freedom Band with special guest Roy Hargrove sitting in. And we played uh, Straight No Chaser. Have mercy. Roy, Roy, Roy did not stop playing. Like when the mic fell, whatever. I'm still playing, baby. Woo! He dug it even harder. Even harder. Yeah. Even yeah. harder. That's beautiful. Yeah, you know, that's beautiful, man. It's so uh, good to real, see you. Real, real quick, uh, do a quick round table here. Um, I, I picked that one because uh, it was a jam. And we all know that uh, Roy never, ever, ever turned down a jam. Uh, mm -hmm. He'd be the first one in, the last one to oh. leave all the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he loved the blues, and uh, even when the heat got turned way, way up, he never stopped being lyrical. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's my quick two cents on on, on Roy. Uh, Freddie, a few words on, on Roy Hargrove. What, what you got specifically from that, that video? Um, <laughs> oh, man, so much. Uh, OK, you mentioned lyricism, definitely their uh, space. Um, he's using uh, dissonance to, to stretch upon the chords. Um, a lot of, man, I heard the first, the first couple of lines he played sounded straight like KD to me. Right. 
Um, so yeah, Texas yeah, is coming yeah. through. Man, I mean, so many influences, man. I mean, what can I say, man? It's perfect. Yeah. Ted Chubb, <laughs> care to join in? Yeah, I mean, the thing that I always love about Roy is he embraced the entire swath of the music, like every era of the music from, and, and was like completely modern, but steeped all the way back to like, you know, Sweets Edison and all the swing cats, the bebop cats, the whole thing knew all the standards. And, you know, for my generation, he was the guy we were in complete awe of that we would, you know, growing up in Ohio, we would drive two to three hours just to hear a set. You know, just to hear one, you know, to hear that, hear his horn, hear him play. He was one of those people we would, I mean, for, for people who came up and I mean, you know, he's your generation, Christian, but all of us who grew, you know, graduated in the late 90s, early 2000s, he was just someone that we were in complete awe of. Yeah. And I don't think any of us ever left that awe. We still have it until, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and still continue to. Yeah. Yeah. Marcus. Yeah, we are still talking about it, right? And it's never going to end. Great Roy Hargrove, man. Um, the things, many things that I think about when I hear Roy play, he would always sing when he played. He, he would, he was just so honest about himself when he plays music. And it seems that um, he's very confident because he knows everything is coming from here and he knows what's inside of here is beautiful. And that's what comes out when we hear him play. Just honesty, beauty, singing, and just soul. Beautiful. It is. Yeah. Nathan? Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, there's the lyricism is so apparent, but listening to that solo, I'm just amazed at how, like, each chorus, it's like the energy and the intensity in his playing just was able to keep, like, amping higher and higher. And you get about two thirds of the way through the solo, and it kind of feels like, where's he going to go from here? And it's like he's still going to go like for gears, where it's not necessarily notes, but it's just like the energy, the, the energy, right, right. In his sound, you can just feel it. And, yeah. that was and he didn't awesome. play in the upper register until towards the the, the the climax of the solo, like towards the end of it. Right. Yeah. He made you wait for him. So he totally built built it up from top to bottom. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, that was our first selection of the night. Yeah. Roy Hargrove sitting in with the Chick Corea Freedom Band. Uh, I also want to give a uh, special acknowledgement to the great Roy Haynes, who was just swinging like a damn train on that track. Mm, mm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling Looking you, listen 18. Man, I'm telling you, you, listen to Roy Haynes play, man. You just get that neck popping. Like, woo, feel that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. The next thing we have, uh, Marcus Printup, I think you are up next. Okay. Uh, let me set this up. Uh, Marcus, you have Weatherbird up by oh, Louis yeah. Armstrong. Please introduce yeah. that for us. We're going to go way back to 1928, Louis Armstrong. Earl Hines off of, um, he had a series of records with a group called the Hot Fives, Hot Sevens, but um, this is one of my favorite tracks. And when I was told to listen to this in, in college by the great Kevin Bells, he's a great pianist in Atlanta. Kevin said, man, check out Louis Armstrong. I said, yes, hello, Dolly. Hello, Dolly. I don't want to check that out, which is also, <laughs> which is also killing in his own way too, don't get me wrong. But he uh, introduced me to, to early Louis Armstrong, 1928. And I heard this, and I was like, "Wow, pops is killing." Yeah. And the thing, the, the, the one of many things I that I love about this track is just hearing the way that um, the Louis Armstrong and Earl Hines are playing together. They have the same kind of bounce, like that pop. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. So this is um, Louis Armstrong, Earl Hines, Weatherbird Rag, nineteen twenty-eight. This was written by King Oliver, by the way. Let's check it out. Thank you. 
Uh, say a few words about that one one more time, if you don't mind. You know, it's just something about the way Lewis played notes. Like if he were to play, you know, I didn't do this in the sound check, and I, and, I, and I hope it's not too loud. But if I'm playing that Ooh. same melody, if, I've got my <laughs> the pops is like that that little tremor, right? right. <laughs> Bouncing, right? Right. That's the thing. I, that's the thing I get from, from from Louis Armstrong. It's that bounce, and it's really funny, you know, just hearing that the, the, the kind of two feel that they have. Doom, a doom, a doom. I'm curious what it would be like if like Max Roche was playing uh, under Louis Armstrong. Right. It, it would be something totally different. It's still killing, but Louis Armstrong, master of time, master of melody, master of harmony, this right. everything. I love, love, love pops. Nathan. Yeah, I mean, every time I listen to Louis Armstrong play, I'm always struck by, it feels like he's like playing 20 years in the future. Like mm -hmm. when he, the way that he phrased, how he blew through the line, like how he articulated, all of that stuff was just, was how guys started playing in the 40s. Most guys started playing, like before you really heard people on a consistent basis play that way. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he was doing that in like the early to mid 1920s and everyone else around him can sound really great, but they sound like they're from the 20s. And I listen to those recordings and I'm like, this guy's from a different era. Like he just mm -hmm. happened from a young age. Yeah. Yeah. Ted? I don't know. Like for me, I just think when I hear Louis Armstrong, I just think about swagger and confidence. Mm. I mean, he plays with so much style and so much confidence in everything he can do and his facility. And it, and it, it's not with arrogance, it's with love, but it's just so confident. I mean, he made his every single time he plays this, you know, this lead up to the root and nails it every single time. You know, like, like, and, and, and like what we were talking about with Roy with the last thing where each chorus gets higher and higher and higher. And he makes you wait for that high note to climax the whole solo. That's like a pops thing. And he yeah. just nails it. He, I mean, if he if he had any hesitation that he wouldn't make that, he would never go for it. He, but he staked his career on it. Right. I mean, yeah. that's just so confident. That's, I mean, he knew yeah. he was a master. He knew that he, he could do it. I mean, I just, he's amazing. Mm. Yeah. Freddie. The king. <laughs> man, his, I mean, his playing is timeless, man. It's timeless. It's lyrical. Um, it's always singing, man. I mean, he used a lot of vibrato. He thinks like a vocalist, but like with a lot of rhythm. Right. You know, right. He was just the 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 soloist of his time, man. Yeah. What can mm -hmm. I say, man? Trumps everybody. Uh, virtuoso, I, virtuoso. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have a quick story about the uh, about pops that happened actually not that long ago. Uh, I got a I got an email from uh, the great George Ween, and mm -hmm. uh, George Ween made this sound very urgent, made me quite nervous. In fact, he said, uh, "I need to see you immediately." And, uh, you know, that's like getting a call from the principal's office. So um, I, I wrote him back. He says, uh, when's the earliest you can come come by my place? I went, I, I can come by tomorrow. I said, all right, I'll, I'll be there tomorrow. Uh, I go by his place and uh, I'm, I'm nervous. I don't really want to know what he wants to talk about. But uh, he says, uh, you have your iPhone handy? I said, yeah. He said, uh, pull up Spotify. I said, okay. And uh, pull up Spotify. He says, uh Pull up Louis Armstrong playing uh, After You've Gone. Mm. I said, okay. And uh, we start playing it. And uh, I'm really nervous because I'm, I'm, I, th I think he wants to talk some business here. And, uh, and he says, uh, you know the album? So we listen to After You've Gone. He says, uh, pull up, you, you know the, uh, the album Louis Armstrong plays Fats Waller? I said, yeah. He said, uh, pull that one up. So we start listening to all this Louis Armstrong. 
And after a while, I realized that this is not a business meeting. He simply wanted to listen to some Louis Armstrong. Yeah, man. He was, like, great. He was like, isn't this the greatest thing in the world? You know, he wow. said, this, you can't listen to Louis Armstrong and not be happy. You know? That's great. Yeah, yeah. that's great. That, that's that, cool. is, that is very, very, very true. Um, right. Thank you for that, Marcus. We're going to come back to it's your yeah, second selection later. Uh, let's see. We got next on the list... Ah, another one of my former bosses who uh, shares the name as one of our guests tonight, uh, Mr. Freddie Hubbard. And um, Freddie Hendricks, you, um, you got that vibe, man. There's not a lot of trumpet players who, who actually have the hub vibe, the phrasing, mm. the, 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 uh, the sound. Um, but I would, I would assume it's very hard to be a trumpet player in the modern era and not have to deal with Freddie Hubbard on some sort of a level, right? <laughs> right. Uh, you picked the song for BP. Tell us about why you picked that. I was trying to think of an ideal solo. I mean, to me, almost everything Freddie plays is golden. And um, I was just trying to think of an all round solo of his that captures the essence of what his playing style represents because mm -hmm. um, Freddie Hubbard, to me, as a trumpet player, he really put a lot of thought process into trying to incorporate legit playing into his jazz playing and making it, mm -hmm. make it sound like authentic jazz, mm -hmm. but like, but with chops. Mm -hmm. And so, and what I mean by that is he covers all of the bases, you know, it's going to be hard hitting. It's going to be lush. It's going to be articulate. Um, he uses a number of different devices. Uh, maybe I might touch on that after we listen to it. Oh, I was going to say specifically, uh, everybody knows if you're familiar with Freddie's playing anyway, that uh, his trademark lick uh, is the, is the uh, lip slur. Right. And he has a couple of ways of how he approaches it which hmm. I'm not sure if everybody has actually peeped this. So the traditional way uh, to do a lip slur is just with the, with the tongue, with the, uh, uh, using the tip of your tongue, right? And, uh, and, and the yeah. control of the aperture in the, in, up in here, right? It's so it's no, no head movement, but everything, the flexibility is all controlled from the aperture here. Your armature is nice and firm, but all of the flexibility is here in the aperture. And so uh, you get, you start real slow. It's like e i e i e i e i e i, and you start. Eventually, you you work it up to speed, and you start getting this yeah 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 right. So Freddie got hip to this thing from Dizzy Gillespie called auxiliary fingering, and auxiliary fingering is false fingerings that helps trumpet players to play difficult passages easier. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and all of the all of the, the the line of trumpet players all started copying this from from Dizzy, and it goes all the way down to Roy. Like yeah. I literally saw Roy Hargrove. Like normally, we would play A one and two. He'll play an A third, third vowel, vowel. Third vowel. Which yeah. you never, you don't see that. And Dizzy was the cat they used to do that. It was almost like you're thinking. So you got the trumpet is first valve, second valve, and third valve. So it's like he's thinking in reverse. So instead of thinking first valve, he's thinking from third valve and backwards. So it's like the reverse. And so anyway, um, Freddie incorporated this auxiliary fingering in with his lip slurs. Mm -hmm. Now the thing that makes his lip slurs unique is that not only does he do it the clap the 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 the, the standard way, which is yeah 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 right. He also sometimes changes it up. Now this is real slick. And I haven't completely figured out how he's able to do it at this speed, but sometimes what you'll notice in this particular solo, when he's doing the lip slurs, he's not going, yeah, 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 yeah. He's going, doo, 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 doo. like he's, he's articulating it yeah. with the tip of his tongue. And doing the alternate fingering. Now, do you think that's because he was still developing that? Because as far as I know, this is like one of the earliest recordings of him doing that lip slur. I think he developed it. He was just he he was just able to change it up on command 
and depending mm-hmm. on the tempo of the tune and you know or just how he was feeling it at the time would determine how if he went 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 about it doing it just as a standard slur or or actually articulating it all right well let's check it out this is uh freddie hubbard playing his composition for bp and that bp is bud powell that's and, right uh, this is uh from his 1966 album high blues pressure and uh <laughs> let's take a listen at some freddie hubbard <laughs> My guess is that if you're um, a young trumpet player and you hear that and you say, okay, young kid, that's that's what you're <laughs> aspiring to. I would be like, the hell with that. I'm going to play something. I quit. <laughs> I think that was like the record players on the wrong speed. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ted, jump in there and say a few words about that track. I mean, he's... Freddie's one of those people like that you were saying, everybody has to deal with in some way because his influence is just so huge. And even with all that speed and virtuosity, and it's, it, it's, you can see it in the, in the wide, in, in, in the macro, 
But if you look at it in the micro and you transcribe these lines that he's playing, he nails every single change. Like he's like improvising Ooh. Bach or something. Right. Like that. Right. So, 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 so perfect, you know, that you're just like, how is this person a human being? Like, I mean, it, it, it is. <laughs> It, it don't make no life. sense, man. Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> to be able to play that fast and nail everything. And the, and the tune itself, it, you can tell he was he really experimenting with a number of things. He, he's experimenting with odd meters, switching meters, yeah, up right. tempo, going to slow tempo, right. all of that kind of stuff. And on top of it, trying to incorporate everything mm. that you could possibly do with the trumpet, playing high, being articulate, uh, triplets which was a big thing uh for mm -hmm. the beboppers he wrote the tune for for bud power bud power was the uh bebop pianist of his time right. and and he's trying to exemplify that the memory of bud powell so he's like bam yeah it does have a little bit of that parisian thoroughfare kind of vibe in it ah uh, yeah the thing was, you know right you know it, it has a little bit of like an aesthetic that's similar i never really exactly thought of that. yeah man Whew. Uh, Marcus, want to jump in on that? Yeah, just really quick. That the comments, the composition was like a symphony. Yeah. It's just the tune itself. It's amazing, man. But I'll tell like a quick, no more than 30, 40 second story of Freddie. Yeah. As he got a chance, yeah. As he got a chance to, to record with him in the studio, we did something on Blue Note in 1998. It's called Hub Songs with uh, Tim Hagens. And Freddie was in the studio. It was just amazing to play for him. But I chose to play Lament for Booker. It's a beautiful ballad. Then he wrote for Berkeley Little. Fast forward about eight months later, we're in California. Freddie would always come to my gigs in LA, but whether whether it was at the Jazz Bakery or the Bellage Hotel or wherever, he would always come to my gigs. So this legend coming to my gigs is just so beautiful for him, for him to support me. But he requested that we played Lament for Booker, but nobody in the band knew it. So Freddie shouted, play it a cappella. Wow. <laughs> so Freddie Hubbard, wow. I'm like, Freddie, so. I played wow. the Mitchell Booker. I played it for him. Acapella was it's like a great memory for me. I I, I mean I don't, I don't tell this story often because it sounds sounds like I'm too hey, I played for Freddie Hubbard, but you know, we're we are much trumpet players, so that was just a, a great moment for me to play that for him. Like the musicality, the technique, all of that. I kind of I, I still find that like Freddie's one of often ends up being like the litmus test for me when I feel like I kind of can can do something well. I go back to these <laughs> solos that I've transcribed and I start playing them and and I try to play him along with him, and just like the his his ability to to play the fast tempos, to play double time lines at slower tempos, and just the ease and the fluidity with which they come out, I, I always listen to them and feel like they can't be that hard to do, right. and I play them, and I I can't, and it's just like the what what yeah. he was able to do technically, his the the virtuosity like just mm -hmm. he attained as a trumpeter, like not even putting the musicality into it, but then when you put mm -hmm. the on top of it, what right. that was is really right. remarkable. Yeah. Um, when, I, when I first started playing in, in Freddie's band, which was uh, roughly around the same time I went on the road with Hargrove for the first time, you know, when you get the when you get a chance to be around certain legends and spend time with them, you know, um, you're excited. You're excited. You're nervous. You're like, oh man, I hope I hope I can do this. Right. Freddie Hubbard was the first person I ever played with where sheer fright, sheer terror is what I felt. Wow. Because wow. Uh, I thought I'm nowhere as good on my instrument as that. I'm not sure anybody is as good on their instrument as that. Why mm -hmm. are we playing with him? How can we stand up to this? <laughs> right. How are we going to be able to compliment him as his band <laughs> when he so like towers over everyone so, so tall, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. And you know when I first started playing one, he was, he still sounded like that, you know. So he he still had all of his chops, and uh, almost every night his opening song was Bolivia, and uh, I mean I I was I was literally moved to tears almost every gig just because uh, I had never heard anybody play a trumpet like that, and uh, I I I do know about the trumpet like with any instrument you you got to warm up you got to shed before you play. I never saw Hub shed before before the game. <laughs> he never came to sound check. He never wow. rehearsed. 
he, wow. he comes straight to the gig, pull the horn out of the case, and go up and bam. And we all be like, wow. Yeah. And That's then be great. grinning and smiling and cracking jokes. We'd be like, man, this, this <laughs> guy ain't, he's, he's not from this planet. No, no. <laughs> That's great. Freddie Hubbard. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Nathan Eklund, I think you are up next, my man. You chose uh, the late, great Fad Jones. Woo! He, is, yeah. he is an unsung hero to many. Um, a lot of people know about his writing and his arranging, but they don't talk about him as a trumpeter. And mm. uh, tell us why you chose this track. Well, I, I, I picked that for a combination of reasons. I do agree. I think that he's probably most well known for, for the charts that he's written in the big band realm, the band that he had, uh, that he co-led with Mel Lewis for many years. And, and he really is kind of seen as one of those hugely influential voices in the big band writing world. Um, but as, as, I got to, as I got to know him, going to William Patterson, he was the first artistic director at that school. And I, I got hip to him pretty quick when I, when I showed up at the school and really started checking him out in terms of kind of all the different facets of who he was. The 10 years that he played in Basie's band as a, as a trumpeter, that's where he kind of started doing his writing, but he was also, you know, he played a ton of, when you think about those, those recordings from the mid to late fifties and all of these quintessential trumpet recordings uh, or trumpet solos on the recordings, he was the soloist, a ton of them. And, and what, he, what he brought um, as a musician, there's a bunch of albums small group albums. I did the Magnificent Thad Jones in, for Blue Note in kind of the mid, mid 50s. Uh, and I know Max Roach played drums and I think Mingus might've played bass on, on, if not that album, one of the other ones, but he was working with all of, all of the cats in that era. And um, I, think, I think when I started listening to his big band, I was always amazed at how much energy and passion the band played with. And I knew that they were all great musicians, but I was still always kind of struck by what that was um, in terms of how they, how the band was, had so much energy. And then I started, I finally got to a point where I started watching some videos of the band and seeing Thad stand in front of the band and conduct in front of the band. And I realized that like so much of the passion came directly from him. Um, so, so this, this recording is, is a live recording of the band, I think from 1970 when, when they were on one of their European tours. Um, Thad was also really big on featuring everybody in his ensemble. And one of the ways that he did um, was with the, the great trombonist Bob Brookmeyer, who was part of the group, who did some writing for the band. Yes. So this is uh, actually one of Brookmeyer's arrangements that Thad has featured on a number of times, or, or kind of throughout the whole chart. But uh, he also, uh, Jimmy Nepper plays a great trombone solo in it. But I hope we'll get to that point because you get to see Thad conducting the ensemble and you just get this mm. passion and the drive that comes from that. So this is a great standard called Willow Weep From Me that Bob Brookmeyer arranged for the band.
that's Denver. beautiful, man. That's music. That's yeah. some music, man. There's just so much lyricism that it comes out in Thad's playing, but there's also this constant playful quality that keeps like coming in, you know, like the the little ideas, the little circus theme he puts in the middle of his solo and and just all of these different pieces to to who he was. And I think you hear it in his playing, but then you see that in his personality as a conductor, as a writer. Like this was just who he was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um Marcus, we we chime in on a, a few words on uh, Brother Thad Jones and, and that particular performance. Yeah, you know, if, if you can tell by his writing that he's he has such a keen sense of harmony, and then when he's when he's playing, what he's playing is um, what's a good word? Not abstract. It's um, it's complex yet very soulful. Yeah, and very meant. So that's that's what I hear with Thad Jones. I, I love his playing. Love his writing. Just he's awesome. Thad Jones. Oh, oh, and. Yeah. and I can hear some dizzy coming from him as well. Uh huh. There's a, yeah, yeah, I heard that. Yeah. Ted? He's just an individual. Sound concept, harmony, writing, everything. I mean, he's one of those people, you know, you were talking about McCoy last week where everybody knows instantly. It, you, you can't even copy it. You can't copy <laughs> that Jones. No one can copy that Jones because yeah. it's too individual. Yeah. Yeah. Freddie? Did you see how like he would some of them notes he was hitting, some of the interval jumps and some of the notes he was sliding yeah. to? Yeah, but, it almost, yeah. almost seemed like they, they can't fit, but he, the way he's playing it, it makes makes it fit perfectly. That's mm -hmm. the way he writes. Yeah. He writes yeah. just yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. All the yeah. inner voice, like he writes beautiful melodies up top, but when you're playing like his section, when you're doing section playing of his of dad's music. All of the inner parts, like second trumpet, third trumpet, for man, they're real snaky, man. It, it's yeah. like some oh, yeah. messed up stuff. You'd be like, oh man, <laughs> mm -hmm. and he totally. You can see that he totally hears everything. Yes, yes. Yeah. He yeah. just he was just a wizard at that. Snaky is a good word. He's a genius. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a big surprise for all of you guys, all of you listening in and watching tonight. Uh, we have the former vocalist of the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra on the line with Dee us. Dee. We're gonna bring her in right now. Woo. One, the only Miss Dee Dee Bridgewater is here. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, hey, Dee Dee. We, we, we're gonna open up the floor <laughs> and uh, have uh, Dee Dee say something. Are, are you there, my dear? I am, can you hear Woo. me? Yes. <laughs> All right, Dee Dee. Know, we are, we can feel you. Right. The queen, the queen is here. Hey, I've been wanting to jump in, jump on. I've been like, woo, talking about my men now. <laughs> about my men. Bad, yes, 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 yes. And you, Fred. You, you've shared some great stories with, with, with us um, about that. Would you mind, uh, how, how did you get that gig? How did I get the gig? Yeah. Um, they were auditioning. They decided that they wanted to have a female uh, vocalist. They had a, a male vocalist named Mel Dancy. And um, they wanted to have a female. So they were holding auditions. I, I took off from work. I was a secretary at a bank. And um, I took off and I went with Cecil. I was married to Cecil Bridgewater at the time. And I sat because I was very shy. And I know none of you can imagine that, but I really was. <laughs> I was very shy. So I sat and listened to all of these girls sing, and they were, you know, there was nobody really that was worthy of the gig. And they decided to take this girl. And I, so I went up to Mel, and I said, excuse me, Mr. Lewis. I said, but um, I sing also. Um, and I think I can sing better than any of these girls can I audition? And um, I sat in and they had me do on a clear day. And mm. I think that it was a Bob Brookmeyer arrangement. Mm. But at any rate, um, so I had to do it without having ever heard the arrangement. And Thad told me when to start, when to stop. And uh, I did the song. He told me I was ending it. I ended it. And the audience went crazy. I got a standing ovation and he said, you're hired. And he yeah, 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 yeah. That was sad. Yeah. That was sad. 
But, but you know what I love that I was, I wanted to share when you all were talking about that. I had the honor, think about it. I had the honor of standing beside him mm. for years wow. on that stage. Oh, in the vanguard and on stages all over the world. Yeah. When I would sing, I would stand beside that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. said the band played different when he was in front of the band. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. They said he would just light, it was light up body everybody. movement. Right. I mean, it was, wow. it, was, it, was like, it was like a dance watching him direct the band and how he would use his hands and you know how he would pull that emotion out. It was wonderful, mm, mm, mm. and he was a that wizard was... also because he would change up the arrangements on the spot while we would be playing. Wow! wow. And I, he'd be saying, "Go back to letter E." Right. Okay, go back to letter F. Stop, stop, stop. You know, four bars in. Go to letter blah, blah. I mean, he would be rearranging. It was it was the most wow. extraordinary thing. Yeah, yeah. And with me, he would do that with me, and so. At uh, especially at the Village Vanguard, um, I would sing the song, and then he'd say, "Okay, Runyon," because he called me Runyon. He said, "Runyon, we're going back, we're going back to to letter D." I was like, "Dad, I don't know," and I'd be talking, trying to talk under my breath. I don't know what letter D is, and he said, "Just listen, just listen." Yeah. So I had to listen, man. It was yeah, man. He treated me like one of the cats in that respect. Right, right, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the funniest thing. Runyon. Yeah, I don't know how I got Runyon. I don't know how he came up with Runyon, which in French means kidney. <laughs> so I don't know what he was trying to say. <laughs> no, I love that. Hey, uh, My phrasing, Ready? I think, came from Thad. Um, the way that I hear an arrangement that came from Thad. The way that I program my show, that came from Thad. Yeah. Um, the way I like to feature the cats and then change up the arrangements, you know, when we're performing, that came from Thad. Yeah. He was my school. Wow. He was my music school. Hey, uh, our Freddie, school. Um, and and Didi, you, you know, Freddie, you said that the way Fad played all that snaky stuff kind of in between, you can mm -hmm. tell that he actually All heard day that. long, man, all day. So uh, Cecil told me one of the greatest stories I've ever heard about Fad Jones. Uh, Dee, I don't, I don't know if you were on the plane or, or in the band at this particular time, but apparently Thad had gotten a commission to write something for some orchestra and, and some big band, studio big band in, in Europe. Uh, he was commissioned to write three songs. Or, or three charts. When they got on the plane, he only had two done. And so oh. when they get on the plane, dad wants to take a nap. And so Cecil yeah. was like, uh, dude, you got like one more piece to write. You know, we're we going to be landing in like seven hours. We got a day before we go to rehearsal. So he said, dad was kind of leaning up against the window like this. He said, okay, Cecil, take out your, uh, your manuscript paper. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Thad was like, okay, um, uh, the trumpets, I want a, a, a two beats rest out front, give trumpet one, uh, four eighth notes, right? A, B flat, C, D flat. He freaking notated a whole chart on the airplane wow. while he's half yeah. awake, just calling out the notes, right? Wow. Uh, I don't know once, that once they got to, Once they got to Germany, whatever they were going, he said, you know, the chart had a had a couple of mistakes in there, but he said it was 90% like perfect. Wow. wow. That's great. That's, man. that's sad, man. That's some superhuman mm. stuff there. Mm. Yeah, that's sad. That's wonderful. I also have a story that he, he, a couple of the charts that he wrote, he actually started by writing the whole lead alto chart. He wrote the whole lead alto part and then he wrote the second alto part and he basically wrote the whole chart part by part, but he constructed right. everything in his head and then he just notated it each individual part one at a time through the whole chart. Let's see, that's when you do it every day. Yeah, Lord, that yeah. yeah he was super deep. Yeah. I heard when yeah. they did a lot, when they was traveling overseas with the band, like if they had a vocalist with the band and she wanted to sing a, a song in a certain key, they said, 
they said he would come back the next day with a completely new arrangement. <laughs> he wouldn't like transfer <laughs> the, the key that she wanted and he would write a, a brand new arrangement. Wow. So it's like, yeah, that's, that's, he, that's genius. Yeah. Yes, yes. He uh, was a genius. Let's, uh, let's see. What we what do we have here? We got some questions. Uh, what are some of Thad's most spiritual pieces? Mm. Oh man, there's so many, man. Well, certainly a uh, child is born. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's freedom. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, right. Oh man, there's so many. Yeah. Thad that's more like a question, like what is not. <laughs> I mean, like, you can say that about uh, almost any one of his charts, man. It's all of them are spiritual, and some, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, we're going to uh, move on to Ted Chubb's selections, but Didi, we want to thank you so much for chiming in, and uh, uh, you're going to be our uh, you're going to be our guest next week. So everyone's going yes. to see and hear you. Yes. Oh, I know. I'm excited. You are the All best. Right. And, and yeah, be thank you, guys. I'm, a, I'm really yeah. digging this. And, you know, thank I you wish you all it. had included me from the beginning with the trumpets, because, you know, that's my instrument. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> bitch. So. See you next week. <laughs> all right, my darling. Take care, everybody. I'm going to keep right, listening. It's wonderful. See you, thank Didi. you to bless us. Right. Thank you. Right. Dee Dee Bridgewater, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. um, Ted Chubb, that leaves you, my man. You're up next at bat. <laughs> That's a hard act to follow right there. I don't really, you know, <laughs> kind of wipe this all out there. Oh, Ted Chubb, uh, you the you man. You're going to be fine, man. Uh, you, you, hey, look, you, you, I, I know what you can do. You're going you, you're gonna to kill us. So uh, you, you, your first selection is, uh, is a Miles Davis track, correct? Yes. And, and <clears throat> that's why you picked this. So I, obviously I like almost at, not just every jazz trumpet player, but every person who listens to jazz, one of their favorite musicians is Miles Davis. It, I mean, mm -hmm. iconic, every single era I love so many records from. But the one that I picked was, uh, it's live in Paris, 1949. He's about 23 mm -hmm. years old, 22 years old. It's the mm -hmm. first time he's left the country. And he's you can hear him really coming into his own as his own artist and his own voice but you really hear him still striving to play like Dizzy. Mm -hmm. He has so much Dizzy Gillespie in his yep. playing. And the thing is, people wow. always talk about him as an artist, but I actually think he's an undervalued trumpet player. He was a virtuosic trumpet player as well. And when anyone ever says any kind of stuff about, oh, well, you know, he didn't have the chops, like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> nope. I played this <laughs> record for them, and there's no denying how much trumpet he could play. Yeah. He's so mm -hmm. articulate. His concept is is together, but still out of like a, a solid bebop thing. And 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 really just showing so much reference to Dizzy. And we we all talked about, you know, one of the one of the one of the tracks that's not on the playlist tonight is something by Dizzy Gillespie. But that's probably because every single person that we're playing has something of Dizzy yeah. inside them. Oh yeah, and, yeah. And so I, the, 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 those the connection between those two musicians is so and important. pops too, and pops too. Yeah, and, exactly. And, and, and so I really wanted to to play this track because it, it really shows him, you know, in a you know such a brilliant way <laughs> to, to, to view. Right. Uh, and, and also, you know, something to think about too is you know close after this, he came back to the states and he recorded "Birth of the Cool," and I don't mm. think he ever recorded another record as a side person after that mm. right 23 years old the rest of his career wow. he was just a leader and I, that's just amazing to me to think about so so let's hear it and i think you all will, will check out he, he comes in on the bridge james moody plays the, plays the first part of the melody it's james moody uh tad dameron curly russell kenny clark and miles 1949 impress and it's a live radio broad broadcast um, mm -hmm. And so Miles comes in on the bridge and remind me, does he take the first solo on this? He takes the first solo. So just Great. start from the beginning and we should be Yeah, good. let's check out Miles Davis and company playing Good Bait. <laughs> Thank 
actuellement l'orchestre bebop de Tabdam. Bebop, c'est-à-dire se livrant à la forme d'improvisation la plus moderne du jazz. Cet orchestre est composé de Tab Dameron, un des pianistes de l'école moderne, Miles Davis à la trompette, James Moody, ancien saxophoniste ténor du fameux Gillespie, notre ami Kenny Clark à la batterie et Stila à la basse. You know, a, a, mm -hmm. a, an interesting thing is they, it's because it's a do, it's a, it's a co-leg group with, Ta, with Tad Dameron. They play um, Lady Bird a couple tracks in, and Miles actually quotes the melody to Half Nelson under the melody oh. of Lady Bird. But this is like 10 years, eight, you know, nine years before he recorded Half Nelson. Mm. You know, just an idea he was already playing with, you know, just eight, nine years ahead of time. I, I just every it's single time great. I listen to this, I, I can't get enough of it. I think it's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's an era of miles that everybody forgets about. Yes, so, true. Uh, totally. how he put this together, I mean, and informed, you know, what he did for decades. Yeah. Uh, Nathan. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's, you know, you you, you think about you think about the, the landscape of Miles's career and like all of these different styles of music that he kind of ushered into the jazz world and brought brought forward um and i think it's so easy to lose track of this early stuff and it and it really as ted was saying like it just it it kind of puts that exclamation point on the fact that he chose to play the way that he did mm -hmm. as well to not you know like it's so easy to look at his playing and be like oh he probably just didn't have the technique he couldn't really hang with the other <laughs> guy and it's like you listen to this and you're like no he definitely could he just heard music in a different way and heard heard the space and i think that that was you know, when you look at how what it ushered in with so many of the other bands that he played with later and how it got this conversational aspect in the music, I, I always feel like a huge element of what did that was his choice to leave space and to give room for all of the musicians in his ensembles to converse, to, to add to his solos and to the music that they were playing. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Marcus? Yeah, you know, if people ask me all the time, who is my favorite trumpet player? You can't answer that question. One day it's him, one day it's, you know, Dizzy, one day it's Fats Navarro, whoever. But um, the thing I love about Miles, well, I think that I say his name more than, than any others because there's a quote that um, 
Bill Cosby said about Miles Davis. He said, when Miles Davis is playing, it feels like Miles is like talking to him. I mean, there's something there's something so personal about the way Miles plays, and we, whether he's playing a ballad or he's playing something like that. And um, there's just during this time, there's this this like mentorship that, that of course that, that Dizzy had over him, not over him, but that, that he had on Miles. It's obvious that he's not trying to sound like Dizzy, but that's what he's hearing at the time. And all the stuff you learned from Dizzy from Bird was put into a funnel. And then later on, you know, what came out was like truly him. And it's just great to, to just to hear him at this stage. Yeah. Love Miles Davis. Freddie. Well, <clears throat> I mean, come on, man. Um, <laughs> Miles, <laughs> Miles loved Dizzy, man. He, they said he turned into a little kid when Dizzy would walk in the room. Yeah. So, I mean, and it's obvious. I th what was interesting about this recording, which I was not familiar with, is that on the stuff when he was playing, uh, you know, like the more uh, lyrical stuff that he was doing up in the upper register sounded dead like Dizzy, but the oh, yeah. double time stuff sounded more like Fats Navarro to me. See, yeah. yeah. Did yeah. you peep? Did you guys peep that? Sure. Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Because that was like, that was the thing. Like with Dizzy, like Dizzy did. <clears throat> Dizzy's uh, rhythmical concept was off the charts in them days, and and them guys, you know, in particularly um, Fats, he started to kind of. He did a lot of that, but he started to break off from that too. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, you can kind of hear hear more of that. Like you, as you said, said you start you start to hear more of the beginnings of 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 Miles, and not so much yeah. Dizzy, but he's totally you know tip tip of the derby. They all did, man. Yeah. All of yeah. them. KD, it's language, you know, you know. Pats, right. everybody. Right. Lee Morgan, Tom early Lee Morgan stuff. They was all quoting Dizzy. Yeah, the, the artic his articulation is so clear and so specific, and you know, and and with all the icons. You really like the you know the our articulation is like our touch. It's like a pianist touch. It's a drummer's touch on the cymbal. It's our articulate to me. That's our articulation. It, it shapes our sound that way, and that's really you know how everyone gets their their like individualistic voice in a way to me. And mm -hmm. and but I think a lot of times this is lost. This attention to the detail of the articulation is lost on on in in, the, in today's world a little bit because you know like the, the other influence. On, on Miles the, is Clark Cherry. Yes. You really hear that oh, running articulate yes. style. Well, yes. you know, all that, within all that chromaticism and, and, and those uh, enclosures that he's playing, it's the articulations that, that the articulation that makes it shine. Because right. that gives it rhythm. And that's like what Nathan's done. It, it, he directly lines up with the rhythm section yeah. all the time. Mm -hmm. Before we uh, get to round two of uh, everybody's chart, um, Oh, uh, everybody's selection. Yeah. Um, we're going to open up the floor a little bit and we're going to have all of our attendees. If you're in, you can raise your hand virtually and uh, we will bring you on to ask us any questions. Now, I, I want you all to make sure that you understand that uh, we are not taking requests. Uh, <laughs> these, these, these gentlemen created a playlist specifically that they wanted to share with you. Uh, so I, I've seen a couple of comments come in and say, play this, play that, play this, play that. <laughs> We're not doing that. This, this is not a jukebox tonight. We have a presentation all hooked up for you. Uh, so we are going to open up the floor. I see I see my sister, uh, my, my dear friend from the Bay Area, Kelly Bailey. I'm going to open up the floor to Kelly. And uh, what do you have for us? What's going on, Kelly? Hey, Christian, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. You guys, all of you look great. And thank you, uh, gentlemen. I was the one that was on the phone with you earlier this evening. Thank you for the entertainment. <laughs> uh, I knew I, 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 I saw that one, Kelly. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> uh, Marcus said, don't ask. <laughs> That's right. Don't, don't ask. I, I love you guys. Uh, and Christian, this is you and Melissa are doing a wonderful, there you go, doing a wonderful job tonight. I love it. Listen, listen, you guys, there are lots of female trumpet players 
Yeah. And I wonder if you can name one or two that rise to the level of some of the greats that you've talked about tonight. Because they were Bryant. Claude Bryant. Claude Bryant. Claude Bryant. Okay. Okay. Second one. Well, well somebody today that I think is is amazing is Ingrid Jensen. Hello. Ingrid. Ingrid. Ingrid Jensen. All day. Jamie yeah. Dauber. Yeah, Jamie Dauber. Jamie. Yeah. My, my Darby. college friend. Tanya Darby. Tanya Darby. I love it. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, gentlemen. Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for calling in, Kelly. God I'll bless you. Monterey. Yes, you will. All right, now. Bye. Let's see. Who else do we have here? Where am I Check looking? Out. Left or right? Check out your question. Oh, let's go to the Q&A section here before we open it up again. Uh, Peter Lynn. Oh, Peter, you don't count. We know you. <laughs> 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 Peter Dog, Pete Dog, what's up, baby? Okay, he his question is, what is everyone's insight stylistically on Charlie Shavers? Playing with John Kirby Sextet. Charlie Shavers, a unsung hero. Ooh. Gentlemen, mm. uh, Ted, you want to start that on that one? Underrated master. Yes. And mm. one of the best that ever played the instrument. Virtual. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. virtuosic. Uh, I mean, I would have to say I need to check him out more. And I think almost everybody should because it, 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 there's that much to dig into. Mm -hmm. Nathan, any words on Charlie Shavers? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 wish, I wish I knew his playing better. I've definitely checked him out a little bit. And as Ted said, I think I need to, to, to listen to him more. But he's a, you know, I, there's, there's kind of this whole, there's a whole bunch of guys um, from these years that were great musicians that just never kind of made it to the top. And, and some of that might have been personal things they were going through. Some of it might have been they just didn't get the break that they needed. But um, he's he's one of those guys. I always think of Lewis Smith from the Blue Note era. Mm, mm, mm. Was just yeah. Detroit. Yeah. And, and he just, you know, he did a couple albums for Blue Note and then he just kind of fizzled out. And it, it's, he's another one of those guys too. Carmel Jones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, Marcus, a few words on Charlie Shavers. Virtuoso, man. Um, th those recordings with John Kirby are great. I love hearing him when he played with Billy Holiday, playing those ballads. He was just so yeah, tasty yeah. and so soulful. And also, y'all should Google um, the audience listening. There's two trumpet battles that he was in. One was with um, Buck Clayton. So just Google Charlie right. Shavers, Buck Clayton. That is killing. And another one is with he and Roy Eldridge. Man, it's fire, fire. That's another unsung hero. Yeah, oh yeah. Roy. I'm sure that got a little bit heated. Uh, Roy was not exactly not, uh, he was a little bit a competitive. A little bit. <laughs> Check that out. That, that was a draw, but it, but it was like this the whole time. Yeah, wow. That's that era. They, they all, he's, he's, he's of those guys. They kind of, they all kind of coming around, coming out of Roy. Yeah, yeah. coming oh, yeah. out of that. He's of that generation. Yeah. It's like it's like Charlie Shavers, Dizzy, Buck Clayton, like them guys. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. Uh, and speaking of, oh, go, go ahead, go ahead. Speaking of, I'm sorry, Chris. Speaking of female trumpet players, I just saw where Marissa Webster checked in. She's studying with with the great Terrell Stafford up at Temple now. So, hey, Marissa. Hey, Marissa, what, what up? Don Fagerquist, you know, I, I, he, um, he played in the Stan Kenton band, I believe. Great, great, uh, section guy. Oh yeah, Fagerquist is great. Yeah, great, great, great player. Um, let's see, we, I'm gonna go back to the Q and A section here one more time. Some of y'all got like four or five questions in here. Y'all being greedy. <laughs> <laughs> Trucker players. To Wendy Gilbert Simon, how you doing, Wendy? Uh, what are the panel thoughts on Ted Curson? Philadelphia, uh, former Montclair homie. Uh, he had a record called The Trio from 1979 with Ray Drummond and Roy Haynes that has some amazing trumpet playing. Also, Blue Piccolo with Cecil McVie and Steve McCall and Jim McNeely. Uh, a few words about Ted Curson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I only saw him play a couple of times, but he was always like, he had fire. I mean, like he was just, he was going for it and really hitting it hard. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm going to jump in real quick because uh, I had a chance to know Mr. Curson well. He was originally from Philadelphia, and uh, he ran the jam session at the Blue Note on Monday night in the early oh, 90s man. when I first moved yeah. to town. 
And yep. uh, I would go down there and sit in with him often and uh, hearing him tell those Minga stories. And uh, he mm. was just uh, quite an imaginative player. He was an imaginative player, <coughs> of fire. And uh, I know, he, I think he moved the, he spent the last decade of his life in Finland. I mean, he, oh, he went about wow. as far away as you can go. I'm <laughs> Claire to Helsinki. Now that's a that's a jump there, Jack. <laughs> wow, wow. Great, 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 great. Cool. Any anybody else want to jump in on Ted Curson? Man, he was just a sweetheart of a guy. I, I played I only got to play with him once. It was very early in my career, but we played right here in my hometown of Teaneck, New Jersey at the Puff and Cultural Center. Mm. And uh, we did a three trumpet summit. It was uh uh Ted, myself, and another trumpet player. If any of you guys have heard, his name is Anthony Branker, mm. the, the head of the department at uh, at uh, Princeton University. Okay. Yeah, the three of us was uh, was playing with the Spirit of Life uh, Ensemble Rhythm Section. So it was like, uh, uh, what's my man's name? Oh, shoot. Basis? Yeah. Uh, damn, I'm, I'm having a, a junior moment. <laughs> 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 but, uh, in any in any case, man, um, yeah, very 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 really great really great guy, yeah. really great player yeah. too. Um, and thanks for the point. record, the trio. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. But th thanks for the record, the trio. I've not really heard Ted. I, I I sat in with him at a jam session at the Blue Note when I first came to New York. He was a great guy. Sounds fantastic, but I don't know what's playing. But I'm gonna check out this record, the trio. So thank you for that information. Yeah, yeah. Nick, Nathan, you want to jump in there right quick? Oh, I, I, I just mentioned at the outset, I, I just saw him play a couple times in Montclair toward the end of his life, but he was just, he always had, you know, just was, was pushing, was always kind of driving, had a lot of fire in his playing and going after it. Yeah. Uh, we're going to open up the lines again, and I see uh, Sam Conan is, uh, he's got his hand up. We're going to open the, the, the phone here, or whatever you call it, open the line. Uh, <laughs> Sam, you are on. How are you doing? Well, uh, so my question is, like, I feel like Miles was not really regarded as a composer so much, um, but more of just like a, more just like a trumpeter, although, um, some, although he did write some pieces that were really important, uh, like, to, like, th that, like, really made a mark on uh, just the jazz world. Um, do you think like there was possibly a reason that um, he was not so much known as a composer? Mm. That's a good, good question. question. Uh, thank you, yeah. Sam. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Which always, one of you guys would like to go first on that? I, I always think of Miles as being a band leader. Like when I think of yeah. Miles as a band leader and he was he was about facilitating the ensemble and whatever was best for the ensemble is is what he did. So you look at that first quintet group and obviously there's some different like um, kind of political elements about that group of trying to get out of a contract. And so they go in and they just play a bunch of standards but he really kind of let the music speak for itself. And then he develops and he gets into the second quintet and he's got guys like Wayne Shorter and Herbie Hancock in his group. Right. And so he's gonna yeah. have guys write the tunes like he looks at it and yeah. says what's best for this ensemble where's the direction that this music is headed and right. he puts those guys he tells them to pen the music for the ensemble and it just seemed like yeah. his his overall focus i mean he certainly wrote a ton of tunes sam as you said in his life mm -hmm. but his his overall focus was about what's best for the band and what's going to make my ensemble sound strongest and he mm -hmm. went whatever direction that was yeah, and I, I think, think even further than that, it's it's he's a visionary. Yeah, right. he's, see, he's seeing the context right. of the music even within society. You know, right. it's, it's bigger than even just and, and how that plays with his band, but to his audience, what's going on in life, how he can mm -hmm. combine different things. I mean, it, it, it's it's so it, it, you know it's it's so wide, you know that it's it's more than just writing a simple tune. And when you when you are a visionary. Just thinking about someone as just a composer seems right. a limited. Actually. And, and, yeah. and basically everything he played, he made into his own anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, like, um, just in terms of like, um, if he was, you know, he took people's tunes and made them famous. Like, 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Like uh, Dave Brubeck uh, in your own sweet way. Right. And yeah. You put that yeah. amp on there, and, and you know, Dave never played it like that. Blue you know, and green he, too. He a lot yeah. of people's tunes, like uh, stable mates. You know, a, yeah. a lot of things. Yeah. He plays well, all the on people's tunes. Uh, around midnight, all of it. Yeah. Many, so yeah. many, so yeah, many my, He made them his own. You Miles know? had that golden touch because you know one one thing that used to baffle me for a long time is that. Uh, most people, as you heard with that very first selection that we played tonight, um, we played Straight No Chaser and F. Most everyone plays Straight No Chaser and F. Ah, uh, B flat. Straight No Chaser and B flat. B flat, right? Mm -hmm. why, do, why do we all play an F? Because Miles played it. Miles Davis. Right. Miles you know Davis. Yeah. How, many Miles other, how many other tunes is the quintessential of someone else's tune, the Miles Davis version? Right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. You know? How many people go to G7 on the bridge of Well You Need Me because of Miles? Exactly. Yeah. And I'm thinking, and uh, uh, no, you should listen to the <laughs> <Lamar> version. Right. <laughs> and he also changed, and Miles also changed the chord changes to Round Midnight. He didn't play right. Monk's changes. He, he kind of played his own changes. And also, I think to add to um, the question, I mean, Miles' sound, Miles's sound was so special. Yeah. I think that pe people like um, Gil... Gil Evans wrote for Miles, and I think that that, that association with, with Gil Evans was so strong and, and so long. Right. People kind of associated, you know, Gil as being the composer that composed for Miles Davis, and maybe that took away from, you know, the fact that people think that he wasn't a great composer. But, right, you know. right. Uh, shout outs to all of our Jazz House Kids family. Bruce Williams. Are you on here, Bruce? I, I didn't see his name. Bruce. Where yeah. you at? Solid. Solid. Good Solid. evening. Good evening. How's everybody doing? What's up, man? Good, man. Mr. All right, everybody. How are you? Thank you. It's been very, very good. It's been very informative and educational and inspiring, actually, you know, to hear all the different points of view about the Trump. I have a great a question about um the relationship between the saxophone and the trumpet front line musical and personal relationship. Mm. The ones that you uh you find the most endearing, you know, in your life or even um classic recordings. Wow, that's great. Ooh, that's a great question, man. Shoot, Ooh. there's so many great front lines, man. Bird and Diz. Um, Train uh, and Miles. Yeah, or or um, Kenny and, and Kenny, Kenny Dorham and, and Joe Henderson. And Joe, Hen Joe Henderson, yeah. And Freddie and Joe, too. Freddie and Joe. Yeah. Woody, yeah. Woody and Joe. Yeah. Woody <laughs> Star and Joe. I mean, there's so many, man. Blue Mitchell Jr. Cook. Yep. Wow. Yeah, yeah, tons and tons, tons and tons. I, I think, you know, and I and from playing, you know, I've played a lot with Bruce, and I know all of you have too. I mean, the thing I, I always find is uh, what, when you, once you know what it's like to find that center with, with another musician, you know it so fast when the other person isn't trying to meet you there, like yeah. in the same place. And that's something yeah. I've always loved about playing with Bruce is that, you know, or people like him is when there, there's so much... A, detail about it's like section playing on the front line and and it's something that i feel like is sometimes lost a little bit and and that people aren't paying attention to you know like they like they should be because we should all be trying to make it you know sound together for the audience like that that attention mm -hmm. you know like nat and cannonball you know right. they make two horns almost sound like a big band sometimes if they had three right. horns oh, they yeah. could, you know they could definitely make it sound like a big band yeah. but two they had almost just as much power because they were so tight Eric yeah. Dolphy and Booker Little. Yeah. Woo! Miss so, Ann. <laughs> now, for all our students yeah. out there, if, if anybody is listening, I would definitely say it's, that, it's super important to, to, to have uh, a strong connection with, with, your, with your, your, your linemen up front because you have to breathe together. You got to phrase together. All of those things. It's, you know, it's like when you've been playing with like, like for for example, me and Bruce were playing together for maybe twenty years, and when we play together, we don't have to think about anything. We don't have to think about playing in mm -hmm. tune. Yeah, we don't have to like, you know, it's like it's automatically there, you know. And and I think that's definitely something to keep in mind uh, in, in your development years as you're developing to, to learn to play the music. Um, yeah, definitely. definitely, definitely something that's super important. What's that song that the, the song that Bird and Diz played? Uh, belly up, belly up, belly up, belly up, belly up, belly up, belly up. Belly up, belly up, belly up. Did, 
that shot course together right. that they play, my, my God, it's amazing, man. They're just like one horn player. No, 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 Beautiful. Nice. The Thank super hip thing is when you start, when you start vibing off each other so much, it just becomes intuitive. Like y'all, yeah. you know, playing the same note at the same time. You didn't, and it wasn't oh, planned. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. Big Solid, we want to thank you for, for calling in. We're going to um, we're gonna have to move on because uh, we're going to have to cut off here in about 20, 25 minutes. But uh, you are the dude, man. I, uh, we love you, and um, we can't wait to see you again. Yeah, Bruce. Big thank Solid. You, Bruce. Big Solid. Take care, baby. Bruce Williams, ladies and gentlemen. Give him a big round of applause with his bad self. <laughs> um, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Yeah, you got it, baby. <laughs> Uh, I want to um, I want to shout out to uh, some of our Jazz House Kids family. Uh, we heard from Bruce, Peter Lynn, asked us some questions. Destiny Diggs, Pinto, how are you, dear? Playing all the playing the mess out there, base. JT Julius Tolentino, I ain't seen you in a in a long time, brother. How you been, man? Candace Reyes, Candace, how you doing, darling? Radham Schwartz, my man, Beersa Chatterjee, uh, Emily Springer. All our Jazz House Kids family, thanks for tuning in this evening. And uh, we hope you had a wonderful time. And uh, looking at the attendees, I, I see a lot of friends. I see some folks from Philly. Wow. Uh, man, all the, all the cats are here. Got some wow. got some Newport folks there. They all in the house tonight. So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, gentlemen, as I suspected, we're not going to be able to do a full second round. So um, ugh, I hate I hate having to be the judge on this. No, 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 no. Let, 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 let's let's see how we're going to do this. Uh, I'm going to go up to Nathan. We're going to go to your second choice, uh, which was uh, the late great Claudio Roditi. Yeah. And uh, Claudio, would you say a few words about our recently dearly departed friend? Yeah, um, Claudio was was a great friend and mentor of mine, uh, gone way too soon without a doubt. Um, but just, you know, he came, he, he grew up in Brazil. He brought the bossa nova and the Brazilian style of music to the States with him and, and was, such a, was such a key player in kind of fusing, I certainly wasn't the only one, but one of the, one of the key musicians of kind of fusing that, that bossa nova Brazilian style in with the jazz world that we had. Um, Claudio as a person was just just such a such a loving human being he had he had love and and interest in every person that he met um, I just really briefly I have a great story of a, a good friend of mine that went through a really rough breakup and we went and saw um, the United the Dizzy United Nations band play at Blue Note Claudio got us on the list and we went and hung out and the whole way we drove uh, back to New Jersey from the city my friend was staying at a place in New Jersey and, and, and as soon as Claudio kind of found out what was going on, when we got to the car, he forced his way to sit in the back seat with my friend and the whole way home, just like had a conversation with him and talked to him. And after we dropped Claudio off, my friend was like, he had, he had the biggest smile on his face that I had seen in weeks. And, and it was just, it was just kind of the infectious, um, caring personality that Claudio car carried with everything that he did. So on top of that, you know, he, he really brought, he brought this bossa nova style into, into the music that he played, but he was a jazz musician at heart. And this was what he carried. He always, you know, he had, he had this precision with what he did, but he just had this fire and this passion in his playing that was always so apparent. And it was, it was a part of who he was as a human being and how he embraced the music and how he talked about the music with anybody that was interested in talking about it with him. So this is an original Bossa composition of his. Uh, what's, the, what's the name of this piece again? I'm, I'm always nervous trying to pronounce things that aren't English. Uh, uh, it's, it's Bossa Pra Donato. I'm probably massacring the pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, a, C a Seattle accent is better than a Philly accent. Isn't it? <laughs> the beauty of Claudio is that he, he would have pronounced it for me and made sure that I knew exactly where I pronounced it. All right, well, let's check it out.
Claudio Ruby. Yeah. Yeah, Claudio. Yeah, man. Tell, some, somebody tell me about that horn he was using. Like, what, what, what's... Oh, rot rotary valve oh, trumpet. Rotaries. Rotary valve trumpet. As opposed so to rotary pistons. valves is, is what they what they use to, for for French horns. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Does, does anyone else play that kind of trumpet? I've never seen that. No, nope. he was the master of that. Yeah, yeah, in the jazz world, he's one of the few. They're actually used a lot in um, orchestral music in Europe. Most of the orchestral players in Europe play them, and Claudius spent a ton of time in Europe and and got connected to them. They have a they have kind of a lighter articulation than a standard piston trumpet does. And, yeah. and he just got really connected and engaged with, with the way that it felt to play, play the horn. And, and that's what he played, mm -hmm. certainly not for his whole life. He played a fair amount of piston trumpet earlier on. He actually played a bunch of valve trombone with mm. um, Keto. In that's, the another, that's another rare instrument. Oh, wow, wow. Uh, but but once, he, once he got a little further into his life, he, he started spending some time in Europe and got connected to the rotary and, and played it for most of the latter portion of his life. Does does the sound is, is is I mean it doesn't sound much different like because I, I know like the the shape because he's articulating a lot it don't normally sound like that it's a more yeah, direct yeah. The the articulation yeah. of the valves is much more mellow when right. yeah. like a rotary valve instrument but he's really laying into the articulation to create that exactly. it's a different feel as well like when you're playing it the the, the feel is like much different for me at least it's, it's very yeah. much different yeah. wow to me too to me too it's, yeah. it's much yeah. It's harder to me. Wow. Yeah. I like more work. He used to hate playing that on, on up tempo stuff because from all of the digit mm -hmm. gigs that we played together, because it's super hard to play up tempo breakneck tempo stuff on mm -hmm. rotary. Yeah. Up there. Then you start losing, you become like like butterfingers and stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Ted, Ted, I'm glad you actually didn't say too much here because this next track I'm going to play is your second track. Uh, oh, okay. Someone who we haven't talked about too much, uh, at least in this panel discussion, and that's uh, Booker Little. Mm. And um, please, please tell us about this track you chose and why. So I, uh, most of what I know about Booker Little uh, was told to me and I got through my teacher, Bill Fielder, who we all just called Prof. And uh, he taught lots and lots of great trumpet players. He taught at Rutgers for many, many years. And he was a student with Booker at the Chicago Conservatory in the 50s. Uh, they were classmates and they studied with Bud Herseth and Vince Chikowitz together. Wow, wow, wow. I was learning, wow. I was learning, I was learning wow. Prof's wow. concept of flow mm. um, that, that was taught by these classical or, uh, trumpet players. And I was looking for different models uh, in, within the jazz world that had this kind of model of that sound and articulation and that I knew, you know, because I was trying to submerge myself in that sound. And so Booker was the obvious choice because he came directly out of that Chicago school of brass playing and, 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 and airflow. And so uh, for like literally like two years, I really didn't listen to anything else besides Booker Little. And, um, you know, as many of us know, Booker died when he was 23 years old right. of a mm. kidney disease called uremia. That's actually a thing that would be very uh, curable. But, mm. uh, you know, he started recording when he was 18 years old. And, and wow. what he was able to do from 18, 19 years old to 23 is absolutely unbelievable. And, um, you know, his, his, his technical clarity and articulation his, 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 the way he had his sound ring in all the registers, it didn't matter if it was low, middle, or high, he had the same overtones that were resonant and clear, uh, same at every volume, uh, and just brilliant, brilliant ideas. And, you know, it's funny, like, I, I, was, I was reading a bunch of different things that some of the cats used to say, you know, if you read, like, old downbeat articles and stuff like that about him, yeah. Oh, well, you know, he's really great, but he plays a ton of notes. He plays too many notes, you know, mm -hmm. and, and within that four year sp span that he was recording, if you listen to the records of the last year of his life, he actually refined, way refined his style and simplified yeah. his style and was really searching for uh, ways to uh, identify emotionally with the listener by playing less notes, by using different types of, a minute ago, was Eric Dolphy. Yeah. And Eric Dolphy 
and him really had a lot of these different intervallic concepts and uses of dissonance with their playing to to like kind of express emotion. And I don't, I, one rumor I've heard is that uh, Coltrane actually asked Booker to join the, the quintet. Yeah, Booker was I so heard that too. Yeah, that I heard he, that too. That he said, you should get, you should get Eric. Uh, because I'm not going to be able to do this. I, 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 I can't do it. Uh, so the wow. last, what I, what I feel, you know, he has Thank so you. many great records and I, I encourage everybody to check them out. But the one that sticks with me the most and I think is the most powerful is one entitled Out Front. Uh, yep. And compositionally, it is, I mean, we were, Freddie was talking about this earlier with, with the, the track he chose with all mm -hmm. the, you know, all the different tempo changes and meter changes and, and where it's like almost symphonic but then still swinging, still has the blues, still has everything in it. Out front has a lot of tunes like this. And it's also uh, very much through composed. Every track mm. leads into the next one. And so it's, it's really almost like an epitaph because at this point, uh, this was in the spring of 1960, 61, 61 I think. 61. Uh, yeah, he yeah. knew that he was dying at this point. Yeah. And he mm -hmm. was dead by the fall. And... Um, the, the, the track I chose is just, it's basically just him taking a solo uh, over a horn vamp and it's called Man of Words. And I think it's one of the most uh, melancholic, beautiful pieces I think that, that really exists. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's take a listen. Book a little Man of Words. <laughs>
Yeah, it's beautiful, man. Wow. Mm. He's popping those high Fs, those high Fs like like the like like they're easy. Right. Ah. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> beautiful book, man. Singing. Buddy, I can hear some miles in there too, man. Oh yeah. right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, it's funny Ed, when you point out that you know he would be he would be gone within a matter of months. Mm, mm. Keeping that in mind, this this hits even deeper. Yeah, you know? I was yeah. thinking about that. And he yeah. knew it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew he was going to be there to be here to probably hear the hear the release. You know. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, and Prop even told me he said. That because he was, you know, he said that he was buried in the suit that he's wearing on the cover of this yeah. album. Oh wow! Wow! It really is, you know, it's like a la it's like a man's last statement about right. what what is the light, what is what it means to be alive, mm -hmm. and to have that much maturity and that much to say at twenty three. I mean, right. he had to have it. That's amazing, because man. He, and he, it's not like he was taken suddenly. He that he knew this was coming. Yeah, yeah. I was saying, I think I said this at the sound check about Freddie, um, him talking to Freddie about Book Little. Freddie Hubbard said that there are two trumpet players that scared him. One was Woody Shaw, and the other was Book Little. Yeah, he had told me that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, not so much about Woody, but he definitely said yeah, it yeah, about yeah. Booker. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, you know, what was also deep about that is, did you realize that Freddie, both Freddie and Booker are both Aries, they're five days apart. Mm. Oh the man, same wow. Year. Didn't know that. Was wow. April 2nd and Freddie was born April 7th, 19th. That makes it deeper. Wow. And one was, mm. was died short of his life and one got to live more of a, a you know, decent amount of time. Yeah, much, much longer, yeah, yeah. Two wow. greats, two greats. Uh, gentlemen, I, I hate to say that we have to come to an end, but I'm, I'm going to play uh, one more for us. And, um, you know, for, for all of you that tuned in tonight, we, we thank you very, very much. Um, obviously, we couldn't get to every trumpet player that so many of you guys wanted to hear. But um, I'm going to play one last one for you, and I look forward to hearing all of your, uh, your quick comments on this. Um, my second choice was... Uh, Young, uh, a young Wynton Marcellus. This is Wynton Marcellus nice. at age 23 playing with the VSOP2 band, mm. with, uh, his brother Branford, Herbie Hancock, Ron Carter, and Tony Williams. Um, yeah. This is from 1983. Um, I'm sorry, 1982. So Wynton was 21. Mm. Wow. Um, and they're playing Herbie Hancock's well known jazz standard. The Sorcerer. Um, yeah. So let's take a listen to Young Winton, and I would love to hear you guys' feedback.
Mm-hmm. Wow. So, uh, there he is. There he is. <laughs> um, when Marcellus at age 21, what do, what do we hear? Man, I hear Winton incorporating his classical knowledge and his classical, classical, classical virtuosity into playing jazz is still sounding soulful. Great. Second thing is, um, I just want to say this about his leadership. He takes care of the cats in the band. He takes care of them. Winton loves his music. He really loves the music. And as this broadcast was going on, I got a text from him because he wants me to write a big band arrangement. So I'm going to get to work on Sibelius tonight start, <laughs> and, and start writing this arrangement. So that's how he is, man. So I love him. He's my boss. There you go. Ted? I mean, it's nothing but, a, a, you know, it's, it, you know, yeah. and, and, and not to mention that, you know, he's 21 and he's getting to play with the greatest rhythm section on earth at that moment. I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Nathan? Yeah. yeah, I was I was just going to say, I think it's, I mean, this is, this, first off, I would say it's impossible or feels impossible to not sound great with that rhythm section playing behind you. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm I'm really struck by by the virtuosity that Winton has and how much he's already developed. But I also think that, to me, he's one of those classic cases. When I when I think about recordings that I've heard of him in the past ten years, the past five years, modern recordings, I feel like he's still evolving as a musician. And I think as I listen to him now, he's he's just one of one of those people that's lived the music, growing up in a you know in a family with his dad doing what he did and and coming up the way that he did like it's just been an an ever evolving process and and his music as great as this sounds i i still feel like listening to him today is a different experience is he's just evolved he's more mature and he's just a, a student of the music which is what we all hope to be to the very end of our lives yeah freddie um two things uh, just to quickly touch on what we spoke about earlier about front horn lines. I mm. mean, lis listen to the hookup him and Branford have. I mean, granted, they're brothers and granted, they've been playing together since they've been teenagers and stuff. Right. But that was like the exempt, that's the exemplary of what I was talking about. Like, they like, they're, they're, they're one, they're not two. One, one breath, yeah, yeah. One breath. Yeah. I mean, they're totally playing off of each other. Just the same as Miles or 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 uh, Wayne and so forth and so on. Right. So right. just wanted to touch on that. And um, he sounded like he was trying to play everything he knows. <laughs> I would love to hear his approach playing that tune. Now I bet he would play half the amount of stuff that he did and be just as meaningful. Right. Right. I guess that tends to happen when you're 21, right? <laughs> but I mean, but it was equally great. Yeah, it, absolutely. And again, you still hear, I hear Winton, and I also hear some Miles in there. So it's amazing yeah. how uh, one trumpet player always affects the other. It never really yeah. leaves. Yeah. I think that always, the influence always kind of stays there. Mm -hmm. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for uh, this evening. It's been a joy hanging and speaking and breaking all this stuff down. And yeah. um, I'm, you know, I, I told you I wasn't going to do it, and I'm not, but. <laughs> oh, come on, man. Come on, Christian, come on, come on, man. Come on, come on, man. I know you got it in you. One, oh, two. Shoot. No, 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 no. No, wait a minute. <laughs> 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 Share. I'm, I'm gonna get trumpet lessons from all y'all. <laughs> all of you out there in uh, internet land, thank you for You're coming. Everybody. And uh, Chris Gifford wants to know where I got this trumpet. <laughs> this was sort of a gift. Long story from uh, Roy Hargrove. Oh, uh, I remember that. Wow. That, that's another story, though. I, I said kind <laughs> of a gift. <laughs> did, did you steal it? <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs>
Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. From, from the jazz house to your house, thank you so much, babe. Thank you for coming and doing this again. Um, to each of you, Freddie, Nathan, Ted, you know, Marcus, we're just really so, you know, happy that, that you did this for us. We already got comments saying part two. When's part two? Really, 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 really appreciate it. A lot of good, a lot of good questions, a lot of good comments from all over the place. Ted, I sent you a couple of emails. You know, they just keep coming. Um, listen, I want to remind you next week, uh, same time, same place, we're going to talk about the singers, the great. And somebody singers. else is going to be sitting in this chair next week. Ain't that right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> ah, come what? on. Now. I'm going to be a sad second, but we're going to do our best. We're going to have Dee Dee. Uh, and we're going to really talk about some of the great singers. You know, this year is the 100th anniversary and would have been the 100th birthday for the great Carmen McRae. So she wow. will be on the list along with so many others, uh, including Pop. So, you know, join us same time, same place. Uh, just a couple of things. If you want to, you know, enroll in something at the Jazz House, write us at info at jazzhousekids.org. This summer, Ted Chubb and actually all of these gentlemen up here will be a part of the Jazz House Summer Workshop. We're going to do it one way or another. Ain't no stopping us now. So again, right. come online, check us out. It is an incredible two-week. Uh, ends with the Montclair Jazz Festival. We go to Newport. Uh, we do concerts every day. We reach about 60,000 people online. It just goes on and on, and it's under the direction of Ted Chubb. Um, I think those are kind of it. I want to thank the folks who helped us play it forward for the next generation by ding, ding, adding to the tip jar. Uh, there's, you know, we, there's uh, still time and big and small all makes a difference. Listen and tell them, you know, these are tough times, but moments like this really do wash away the blues. We want you to be safe, healthy. There's something about sheltering in home. Let's help this nation uh, bring this down and flatten our curve. Uh, That's right. Stay in the, the house. Stay in the house. You know, stay right. in the house. You know what I mean? I'm sick of y'all thinking y'all not, y'all can't be touched. Thank you. Stay Thank in you. the house. Oh, I'm preach, sorry. preach. I'm mad. People not preach. paying attention. That's right. Thank exactly. You. And to the many Thank folks, you know, packing groceries, you know, doing Amazon and bringing them to our house, those people on the front line in the hospitals, I mean, they are the heroes really helping us at this time. Right. But all mm -hmm. we know is we're going to keep swinging straight ahead. Much love. Thank you, Gallo. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man, that was good. Good, Freddie. Good, good. <laughs> Great, man. That was awesome. That was so much fun. Thank I gotta go you. practice now. I gotta practice now, man. Yeah. <laughs>